all right. Turn with me to the book of Acts, Acts chapter number two. We've made it to chapter two. We're going to make it to the end. It's going to be amazing unless Jesus returns. Huh? <laughs> Let me read to you from Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven like a sound, like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Father, this morning, we ask for your grace as we study your word that you would speak to us, help us to see clearly by the power of your Holy Spirit, illuminating the text before us, the great works you have done to redeem your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've been going through uh, the first chapter of Acts for a while now, and we've looked at a number of things. So I just want to kind of glance back over the first chapter of Acts to catch us up to chapter 2. Remember that after Jesus was raised from the dead, he spent 40 days with his apostles. He spoke to them about two things. In verse 3, we see he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. And then he ordered them not to, de to depart from Jerusalem until verse 4, he says they're to wait for the promise of the Father. That's when they can depart, but they got to wait. And the promise of the Father, he tells us in verse 5, is the Holy Spirit. And he told them they're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit in just a few days. Now, as we've seen from our previous studies, the apostles understood very clearly from the Old Testament that the coming of the Holy Spirit and the coming of the kingdom of God, those two things went together. They are both uh, connected to the time that God had promised in which he would restore his people. So in verse 6 of chapter 1, look at what happens. The apostles ask, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And then in verses 7 to 8, Jesus answers this question. And in essence, what he says, as we've looked at, is that, yes, I'm going to, but it's not going to happen in the way that you think. I'm not going to get into when and how. That's going to, or I'm not going to, it's not going to happen when or how you think it's going to happen. It's going to happen a little differently. And I'm not going to get into the when part of it, because the when part of it, that's God's business. But here's your part, verse 8. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. This is what's going to happen. And you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. That's your business. That's your responsibility. Now, after he said this, look at verses 9 and 10. He's taken up into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. This is the most powerful and sovereign position in the entire universe. That's where Jesus is right now. He's at the right hand of the Father. That means that at this very moment, He's the exalted Lord of the universe. He's ruling. He's reigning. Everything is under his power, his authority, his control. And then in verse 12, the apostles turn around and they go back to Jerusalem because that's what he told them to do. And they go and they wait. And what are they waiting for? For the Holy Spirit. And when did he tell them the Holy Spirit would come? He told them in verse 5. It would happen in just a few days. That's what the phrase not many days from now means. Now we come to Acts chapter 2. This details the events of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you kind of a breakdown of the chapter. Verses 1 to 13 tell the account of the Spirit's coming. That's what we just looked at, what I just read. We're going to look at that today. 
verses 14 to 21 is going to be Peter's explanation to the crowd about what has taken place. And then in verses 22 through 36, he's going to explain to them why this has taken place. Then in verses 37 to 40, he's going to tell them what they must do because it's taken place. And then in verses 41 to 47, we're going to see about the crowd and how they respond. So today we're going to look at the account of the Spirit's coming in verses 1 to 13. Look at verse 1. It says that it happens on the day of Pentecost. Now, as those of us who are living on the other side of this day, of this event, we could mistakenly assume that the day of Pentecost has always referred to the day in which the Holy Spirit came. But the day of Pentecost had a meaning long before the day in which the Spirit came. It was, in fact, one of the Jewish festivals that took place on an annual basis. It was known as the Feast of Weeks. So if you were to look back in the Old Testament and read in Leviticus, you would read about the Feast of Weeks. This was one of three festivals that took place. There were a number of festivals, but this was one of the three that required that all Jewish men come to Jerusalem to observe this feast. So they couldn't just observe it in their own hometown. And it was called the Feast of Weeks for a number of reasons, but basically this was a feast that celebrated the beginning of the harvest. And so it was sometimes also referred to as uh, the Wheat Harvest Festival. It was about the first fruits. These were the moments in which they brought in the first of the crops, and those first fruits guaranteed there would be more fruit to come. Just like when Christ is raised from the dead, he's the first fruit in the sense that it's a guarantee that there will be more resurrection to take place for us. So in the New Testament period that we're in, this was also associated as a feast related to the giving of the law and to the renewal of the covenant. Now, why is it called Pentecost? Well, during the time of the New Testament, they started referring to it as Pentecost because Pentecost is a Greek word that simply means 50. Now, why is 50 important? Because when did this festival take place? It occurred seven weeks. Now, seven times seven is 49, so roughly 50 days after the Passover. So the Passover took place, and then 50 days later came the Feast of Weeks, and that's why it was referred to in the New Testament times as Pentecost. So notice here it says in verse number one that the day of Pentecost arrived. Now the word arrived there is significant because it carries more meaning to it. It carries the meaning of fulfillment. So it doesn't just mean we got to where we were going, but it means that something was fulfilled. And Luke is indicating through the use of this word here that a new critical stage in the fulfillment of God's promises is about to take place. Something is going to happen when this day of Pentecost has arrived that's going to signal a transition. This is going to be a new moment in human history. And he tells us that these people were all together in one place, these being the 120 disciples that we read about in chapter 1, verse 15, which would have included the now 12 apostles, because the 11 have added Matthias to the number of 12. And the one place is probably still the upper room of the house they were staying in. It says in verse 13, they were in a house. Now look at verse 2. Suddenly, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Now underline that phrase, a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And filled the entire house where they were sitting. And then verse 3, I want you to underline this. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them. And then they rested on each one of them. And verse 4 says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And underline this. And began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So those three things I've had you underline are significant. Notice first Luke tells us that what happened happened suddenly. Even though Jesus had told them back in verse 5 of chapter 1 that the Spirit would come in just a few days, they were still surprised. They were shocked. This happened without any warning. There was no warning. It just suddenly was upon them. It happened. And this coming of the Spirit was accompanied by these three observable signs that I told you to underline. First, there was a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Second, divided tongues as of fire appeared to them. Third, they began to speak 
in other tongues. Now notice this first sign. It says, suddenly a sound like a mighty rushing wind comes and it fills the entire house where they were sitting. Now, notice it says a sound like a mighty rushing wind. So it's not necessarily that it is simply a mighty rushing wind, but the sound is being described and compared to a mighty rushing wind. That phrase like in English, we call this a simile. And so the word for spirit here in the Old Testament is the Hebrew word ruach. And this is a word that in the New Testament is translated in Greek as pneuma. Now those two words are both important because sometimes those words are used to describe breath or wind and at times they're used to describe the spirit and so they get translated both ways. Now a few weeks ago you'll remember that we looked at a number of Old Testament passages that spoke about this promised time in which God would pour out his spirit on his people and we saw that each time that God was promising to pour out his spirit that it was connected to the time that God would restore his people. Now two of the passages that we looked at were Ezekiel 36 and 37 so now we're going to go back and we're going to look a little deeper at those. So look at Ezekiel 36 and we're going to look beginning in verse number 22. In Ezekiel 36, verse 22, we read these words. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations. So Israel didn't just sin and it affected them, but the nations were affected by it. Israel brought shame upon the name of God before the nations in which you have profaned among them. And the nations, notice when God vindicates his name, the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. So notice, when God vindicates his holiness, it's going to be in the sight of all the nations, not just Israel, all the nations. Verse 24, I will take you from the nations, and I will gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. So when God does this, he's going to gather the people in their own land. This is the language of restoration. Remember the apostles asked the question, in connection with Jesus talking about the giving of the Spirit and the coming of the kingdom, what did they say? They said, hey, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom? They understand this language. Verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. Notice, where is the spirit going to be when God pours out his spirit? It's going to be in them. It's going to dwell inside of them. And the result of this is, look, it's going to cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So whereas the people of God didn't obey God before, now they're going to obey God. And they're going to obey God because they're going to be enabled to do so because God's spirit is going to live within them. Verse 28. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. So notice once again, they're going to receive the Spirit, and they're going to be restored. And those two things, they go hand in hand. Now the rest of chapter 36 in Ezekiel tells more about this restoration. And then we come to chapter 37, in which in this chapter, exiled Israel, who's been thrown out of the land, Therefore, has to be restored to the land. Israel's out of the land. They're in exile. They are symbolized in chapter 37 as being dead, dry bones. Look at Ezekiel 37, verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me. So Ezekiel is having a vision. And he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord. Now, I want you to underline the word spirit there. This is that Hebrew word ruach. And it's going to appear 10 times in verses 1 to 14. And I'll point them each out to you. And he set me down in the middle of the valley. And it was full of bones. So, so here is Ezekiel and he's surrounded by bones. Nothing around him is alive. He's surrounded by death. Verse 2. He led me around the bones. 
and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. In other words, they'd been dead a long time. They're beyond resuscitation. These are dead bones. He said to me, son of man, can these bones live? Now, this would be a ridiculous question if we went and we saw a pile of bones somewhere and they'd been long since, uh, lo they, they lost the flesh that was on them a long time ago. We'd look at them. And if I said, do you think those bones can live again? That would sound like a foolish question under most circumstances. He said, can they live again? And I answered, oh, Lord God, you know. I think it's a great answer. He said, don't ask me. <laughs> I can't do anything about it. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, now we're talking to bones, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Now this would be nonsense to speak to dry bones. Dead things don't typically hear. But scripture tells us that when the Lord speaks to dead things, dead things come alive. Thus says the Lord God to these bones. God speaks to these bones. Behold, I will cause breath Underline that, second use of the word ruach. Remember it appeared in verse 1 as spirit. Now it occurs as breath. I will cause breath, wind, spirit, life to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put, number three, breath in you. And you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So when the word comes, there will be life. When Jesus is the word comes, there is life. When Jesus is raised from the dead and the gospel word is preached, there is life. Verse 7, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound. And behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath. Number four, there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Number five, prophesy, son of man, and say to the number six, breath. Thus says the Lord God, come from the four, number seven, winds, and, O oh, breath, Look, there it is again. Breathe on these slain that they may live. And so I prophesied as he commanded me, and the number 10 breath came to him. And they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. So as they rise up, now they rise up no longer as dead bones, but as an exceedingly great living army. And then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves. O my people, I will bring you into the land of Israel. Ah, restoration language. And you shall know that I am the Lord. When? When I open your graves and raise you from Israel your graves oh my people i will put my and here's that word again spirit within you and you shall live and i will place you in your own land i'll put my spirit in you you'll live in your land spirit restoration spirit restoration there it is then you shall know that i am the lord i've spoken it and i will do it declares the lord now look back at acts 2 here what do we find we find the apostles along with these other disciples, and they're sitting in a house. And what are they doing sitting in the house? They're waiting for what Jesus had promised would happen. And what did he promise would happen? He said, very soon, here's what's going to happen. God is going to pour out his spirit upon you. And the disciples said, we know what that means. When the spirit is poured out, the kingdom is going to be restored. And verse 2 says, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound, like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Just as Ezekiel had heard a sound, followed by, Ezekiel 37.10 says, the breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood on their feet in an exceedingly great army. Now look at this. Now these 120 disciples hear a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it's followed by what? The Spirit of God coming into them. Causing them to do what? 
to do what Ezekiel 37 says, live and stand on their feet as an exceedingly great army for the Lord. What's happening here, and we must not miss the significance of this first of the three signs that take place on the day of Pentecost. What's happening right here is that God is creating for himself an exceedingly great army of witnesses to carry out his mission, which is to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now God's army has stood up. This is the significance of this sign. Now we come to the second sign. Verse 3, divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Now, this second sign is often misunderstood based on a misunderstanding or a misinterpretation of the words of John the Baptist in Luke chapter 3, which we looked at a couple of weeks ago. In Luke 3, verse 16, remember what John the Baptist said. Verse 16, John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I, that's Jesus the Messiah, is coming. I'm not even worthy to tie the straps of his sandals. Now look at this. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now remember I told you that the English word baptize is the Greek word baptizo, which means to be immersed into something. And so when Jesus told the apostles in Acts chapter 1 verse 5 right here, you will be baptized with, or that phrase, that word with could be translated in the Holy Spirit, he was telling them that he was going to immerse them in the Holy Spirit. Now, as we learned a few weeks ago when we looked at this text, being baptized with the Holy Spirit is the act by which Christ brings us into union with himself. And in bringing us into union with himself and also with his body, the church, he guarantees our salvation and our future inheritance. Now, that's very different from what we see in, in Luke chapter 3 about being baptized with fire. That, on the other hand, remember, is the act by which Christ judges non-believers. So you're not baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire, even though these charismaniacs run around and whack people on the head and say, I baptize you with the Holy Spirit, fire, and then do that. That's just some sort of circus act. That's not what's happening here. In fact, the opposite. To be baptized with fire means that you are being judged by Christ. You are being not united to his body, but separated from his body, cast into outer darkness. It's the exact opposite of being baptized with the Holy Spirit. It is, in other words, to be immersed, not in the spirit, but to be immersed in the fire of judgment. Therefore, that's not at all what is happening in Acts chapter 2, verse 3. When the Holy Spirit descends and it says that these divided tongues as a fire rested upon them, we cannot then look at this and say, oh, well, there's either we're being baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire because not a single one of these people was being immersed in the fire of judgment at that moment. No one was burning in hell. In fact, they were being baptized with the Spirit of God. Dead things didn't have the Spirit. These dead people now have the Spirit. Here's what it says. It says, you'll notice, divided tongues as of fire. Notice that it says as of fire, just like it said, like a mighty rushing wind. It's another simile. In fact, the CSB translation says this, they saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. So in other words, these are not literal tongues of fire, but rather this is the description. It appears to them that way. Now, key to understanding what these divided tongues of fire that appear to them and rest on each one of them are is to remember that Acts 2-3 is telling us something significant. What is happening in Acts chapter 2 is what Ezekiel said in Acts chapter 37, verse 14. I will put my spirit within you. This is what's happening in Acts chapter 2. The spirit of God is being placed within them. And so that's what's happening. And so that means that because this is happening, in other words, the purpose of these divided tongues as a fire, or as I told you, the CSB says, like fire, was to give visual proof. This is really important you understand this phrase. It's to give visual proof that the Spirit is now within each one of them. Now, this shouldn't surprise us. Why? Because remember what happened when Jesus was baptized in Luke chapter 3. What happened then? Verse 21, the heavens were opened. Verse 22, 
the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. What does that dove have to do with anything? That dove is giving visual proof that the Spirit is now within Jesus. And here in verse 3, the divided tongues of fire are giving visual proof that the Spirit is now within these believers. You say, well, how come it was a dove when it landed on Jesus, and why is it flames of fire on these people? Well, there's a very important reason for that. So let me show you. In verse 3, these divided tongues of fire evoke a very specific image in the Bible. And the image comes from the Exodus in which fire often represented the presence of God. Look at what it says in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse number 2. This is the account of the burning bush. It says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. Notice here the fire isn't meant to consume, but it's meant to do something. What? It's meant to give Moses visual proof that God is present. It's not meant to burn up the bush. It's meant to give visual proof, just the same as the flames of fire aren't meant to burn the people up because that's what fire would do if it was a baptism of fire. It would judge and consume and immerse them in fire and destroy them. But that's not what it's doing. It's giving visual proof of God's presence. Exodus 13 verse 21 says this, The Lord went before them by day. This is after he has delivered them from Egypt. How did he go before them by day? In a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way. And by night, in a pillar of fire, to give them light, that they might travel by day and night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. Exodus 19, verse 18. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. His sound was louder than the trumpet. And so here what you have is, is you have both sight and sound around Mount Sinai representing God's presence, just as in Acts chapter 2, you have sound and you have sight both representing God's presence. Now, during the Exodus, what had taken place? God had redeemed his people, and after he had redeemed his people, then what did he do? He then led and guided them. And how did he lead and guide them? By his very own presence, which was represented in this pillar of fire. At the end of the Exodus, we come to these words in chapter 40, verse 34. Then the cloud, after all the tabernacle has been built, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now notice the cloud symbolized the Lord's presence. It was visual proof that the glory of the Lord had filled the tabernacle. It wasn't, Moses didn't just say, now the glory of the Lord has filled the tabernacle. He said, well, how do we know that's happened? No, the cloud gave visual proof. The cloud wasn't God. God is not a cloud, but the cloud represented God. Just as God is not fire, but the fire represents God. It's visual proof. Look at verse 35. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting. Why? Because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle throughout all their journeys. Whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they didn't set out. They stayed put. Why? They waited until the cloud went up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Now then, in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, these divided tongues like fire symbolize God's presence now resting on each one of them. See what the text says? The fire divided and it rested on each one of them, meaning that now each and every one of these believers are the tabernacle in which God's presence now resides.
This is why 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says this. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? So notice, just as in the Exodus, what has God done? He's redeemed his people, and after he redeems his people, what does he do? He leads them, and he guides them, and how does he do it? He leads and guides them by his presence, symbolized by a pillar of fire. Now, through the cross and resurrection, Jesus has led the new exodus. He has redeemed his people. He has delivered them. And on the other side of that deliverance, what is he now doing? He is going to lead and guide his people by his spirit's presence. And how can they be assured that his presence is with them? Because just as in the Old Testament, God symbolized his presence by a pillar of fire in the tabernacle. Now, each and every one of these New Testament believers become the very tabernacle in which God will dwell. And this has been forever solidified by his symbolizing his presence in miniature pillars of fire for each one of them to see. You see how amazing this is? You understand why, why I said it's, it's such a blasphemous thing to, to, to run around and s slap people on the head and shout fire at them and make some mockery of this most holy of moments in which what was genuinely taking place is that God was saying, I will give you visual proof that I am present among you in a way that Moses could have never dreamed of. See how much different it is to live on this side of the cross and resurrection? So now then, this pillar of fire is no longer going to lead them from out front. It's going to lead them from within. Now it's going to lead them as God's mighty army that has been stood up to carry out his mission. Now comes the third sign. Verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, like the second sign, this third sign is also often misunderstood. In fact, this is the most misunderstood, and it's also based on a misinterpretation of what's going on here. Um, just like the nature of being baptized with the Spirit is confused for people, uh, so is the nature of speaking in tongues a confusing topic. So I'm not going to look deeply into those issues related to speaking in tongues today. I promise we're going to do that at a later date. I have to keep something to keep you coming back. Um, but for now, what I want to do is I want to emphasize, I, I want to focus on what the passage emphasizes, not what our intrigued uh, theological rambling is emphasizing. So the English word here, tongues, let's just break this down real simply, is the Greek word glossa, all right? And it means languages. That's all tongues mean. So when you hear somebody say tongues, you go, oh man, tongues, woo, woo, woo. It just means languages. So think of, just think of you, if your kid was going to high school and they said, now they have to study, they have to take two semester verses of a foreign language. You say, all right, get in there and learn it. And if you went in there, like they have to take two semesters of tongues. You'd be like, what do you mean, right? See, but if you just change it to languages, then suddenly it means it, it just changes everything, right? Languages. Now, here's what you have to understand. This is not some form of ecstatic speech, all right? They were not babbling on in gibberish. And I, I'm not meaning that to sound offensive to those of you that believe in the concept of a prayer language. I don't believe that's a concept. I will show you that as we come along. But what you see here is this is not babbling on in some form of gibberish. They were miraculously speaking in other languages that were known languages of the day. The context of the passage allows for no other interpretation. There's no room for this. There's not a single room for another interpretation. Why? Because look at verse 6. It says, The multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing him speak in his own language. And because verse 8 says, how is it that we hear each one of us in his own native language? The word translated language there in both of these contexts is the Greek word dialectos. That's where we get our English word dialect from. So in other words, what do we see? The, they're, they're filled with the Spirit, and they begin to speak in other languages just as the Spirit gives them utterance, or as the NIV and CSB says, as the Spirit enabled them. In other words, these 120 disciples that are in the house, including the 12 apostles, 
What's happening to them is, is that they'd never learned these languages naturally before. They didn't go to a class to learn whatever language was being spoken in, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula at the time. Instead, they suddenly spoke these languages supernaturally. They were known languages, but the 120 people that were speaking them had never known these languages before and suddenly they're speaking these languages. Now what's fascinating is, is that Luke doesn't spend a lot of time focusing on these supernatural signs that we've just seen, these three things. Instead, he moves quickly right from those signs, turning his attention to the crowd that's present. He gives more space to describing the crowd that's present than he does to describing the signs that take place. And the reason he does this is because he's focusing on the international makeup of this crowd for a reason. Look at verse five. Dwelling in Jerusalem, there were devout men from every nation under earth. Remember, the day of Pentecost, one of three major festivals that required all Jewish men to come to Jerusalem. And so it says that they were devout men. And they had to be devout men because they were obeying the law. They were coming to Jerusalem. And then it says that they came from every nation under earth. And that's just simply an expression that means they'd come from all over the known world at the time. And it says that these were people that uh, were from every nation, and they, yet they spoke different languages. Now, these were diaspora Jews. And what that means is these are Jews that were uh, dispersed during the exile, and they lived all over the land. These were exiled people that lived all over the place. And therefore, that means they spoke different languages. They'd never come back since the exile took place. And so they're living in other lands, and they've taken on those languages and those customs, and yet they come back time and time again for the annual festivals, and yet they speak a different language. So it's just like an expat. If you live here in America, and you move off, and you live in South Korea, and then your children are born there, they're going to grow up, and they're going to speak the language that the people speak there. Suddenly, these people are shocked, and the reason they're shocked is because they hear their own languages being spoken. Furthermore, verse 7 says they're amazed, and they're astonished, and they say, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Now, we look at that and say, well, why is that important? Well, Galileans were viewed as being very uncultured, unlearned, sort of ignorant, uneducated kinds of people. So these people that came from all over are like elitists living in the Northeast looking down on Southerners. They think they know better. They don't know that we know more. Um, <laughs> because they didn't talk the same way, right? I know this is probably it's taken you a few years to figure out some of the things I say. Uh, Alexa and Siri still don't listen to me half the time. They don't understand what I'm saying. Texas accents are the right accents, and I don't know why Steve Jobs didn't bake this into Siri, but whatever, right? Luke then lists these nations and regions, and I want you to notice that what he does is he names them in every direction. So watch this. From the Parthians, who are in the east, then he goes to the Romans, who are in the west, from the Asians, who are in the north, to Egypt and Libya, which is in the south, then the Cretans, they're out in the sea, and then the Arabs are in the desert. So he covers north, south, east, west, sea, desert, everywhere, and this crowd of people includes both Jews by birth and Gentile converts in Judaism. And what is it they're hearing in their own language? Look at what it says in verse 11. We hear them telling in their own tongues, in our own tongues, the mighty works of God. Notice the emphasis here. The emphasis is not on the mighty miracle of tongues. The emphasis is on the mighty works of God. So those who are speaking in these languages are declaring the greatness and the majesty and the power of God. They're declaring God the Father, who's raised Jesus, the Son, and he's raised him from the dead, and then he's fulfilled his promise by pouring out the Spirit. This is a Trinitarian moment of worship. The Spirit has been poured out. He's restoring his people. All this is underway. Verse 12, what happens? All the crowd is amazed. They're perplexed. They say, what does this mean? Some of them mock. They say they're filled with new wine. And we'll look at these responses in verse 12 when we see Peter's explanation next week. But what I want to do here is I want to draw your attention to this one final observation that I cannot emphasize enough. One that is so extremely important about this event. You see, since the birth of modern uh, Pentecostalism, the, the Pentecostal movement, which began 
on April the 18th, 1906 in Los Angeles, California, in a church on Azusa Street. That's where the whole thing began. And I just want you to just consider for just a moment. The Pentecostal movement began in 1906. So I want you to take that in for just a moment because church history is important. We always have to ask the question whenever we encounter new doctrines. Why would God have left the church in the dark for 1,900 out of 2,000 years of church history? We always have to ask that question about anything we encounter that is new. For only 115 years then, has there been this intense fascination with, and in some circles we could say an obsession with, these three observable signs, uh, mainly speaking in tongues, all right? This obsession has typically focused on the individual experience of tongues, listen to these two phrases, the individual experience of tongues, rather than focusing on the biblical meaning and purpose of tongues on the day of Pentecost. So we like to get wrapped up in our individual experiences of things. Experience doesn't interpret scripture. Scripture interprets experience. We must always come to the scripture to interpret our experience. The emphasis, the focus in Acts 2 is on the biblical purpose and meaning of these tongues, these languages. So as we saw in verses 6 and 8, speaking in tongues, it was not a form of ecstatic speech. It was not babbling in gibberish like we find in charismatic movements. No, not at all. They were miraculously speaking in known languages. The events of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 was not... God causing a bunch of people to speak in Babel that no one could understand. Nope. In fact, it was the exact opposite. It was God causing people to speak to a bunch of people in known languages that everyone could understand. This is why from the very earliest days of church history, going all the way back to the church fathers, the church and its commentators, its scholars, its pastors, its theologians have never, with the exception of the last 100 years, focused on the individual experience of speaking in tongues as occurred on the day of Pentecost. Instead, they have always focused on the biblical meaning of tongues on the day of Pentecost. And that meaning, biblically and historically, has always been understood as Pentecost being the reversal of the Tower of Babel. Now just consider the nature of the word Babel and consider what the modern day tongues movement is. It is Babel and yet for 2,000 years the church has said that Pentecost is the undoing of Babel and yet we've turned this day into the day of Babel. In Genesis 11, what took place? God caused a bunch of people who all spoke in a language that they all understood to suddenly speak in a number of different languages that they couldn't understand and they referred to it as Babel. Now then, here's what's happening. Acts 2 is presenting for us Pentecost as the reversal of Babel. This is God beginning the process of undoing the division of humanity that began with the fall in Genesis chapter 3. The great work of restoration is underway. So look, on the day of Pentecost, what do we see here in this text today? God pours out his spirit on his people, just like Ezekiel 37. And when that happens, he creates for himself what? An exceedingly great army. And what is this great army going to do? It's a great army of witnesses that are going to carry out his mission to the very end of the earth. What else happens? Well, the second sign, on the day of Pentecost, God pours out his spirit on his people, and just like the Exodus, God's presence is now going to be with his people. And what's going to happen? He's going to lead this exceedingly great army of witnesses to carry out his mission to the ends of the earth by his presence being with them at all times through his spirit that dwells in them. 
Then we come to that third sign. On the day of Pentecost, God pours out his spirit on his people. And when he does, he begins to reverse the curse of Babel that started in Genesis chapter 7 or Genesis 11 as this exceedingly great army of witnesses is now to carry out his mission to the end of the earth. And there will be no barriers that will stand in the way because he has supernaturally removed all the barriers symbolizing the restoration not only of Israel but of the world has begun and this great army will lead that cause. At Babel, what do we read about? At Babel, the people of the earth, what do they do? They gather around a tower and as they gather around the tower, they worship themselves. And as they worship themselves, they say that they believe that glory and wisdom and honor and power and might belong to them and that they are the ones who should be worshipped and adored, basically. They want to make a name for themselves. And how does that end up for them? It ends up with disaster and with division. Pentecost marks the reversal. It marks the moment in which God begins the process of undoing all of this madness. And that process culminates how? Well, it culminates with the people of earth gathered now around a throne, no longer around a tower, but now gathered around a throne, worshiping God, proclaiming of God that glory and wisdom and honor and might belong to him forever and ever. The story of humanity in the end doesn't end in division and in disaster. It ends in salvation and in unity. And that process began on the day of Pentecost. Listen to how the story ends. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from every tribe and people and languages, they stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. This is where the story ends. This is where history is headed. And Acts chapter 2 is the start of the end. It's the start of the end. And so understanding then that Pentecost has a very significant biblical meaning to it. And the biblical meaning is not to be found in the individual experiences of people as they've described them only for the past 100 years, but to join with the history of the church and the church fathers for 2,000 years of church history saying, we know what Pentecost is about. It's not about the day in which people began to speak in Babel. It's the day in which God began to reverse the effects of Babel and to bring history to its conclusion before the throne of Jesus to worship him forever. And therefore, let us join with the angels and sing to the risen Lord Jesus, falling on our faces before his throne until the day he comes and then on into eternity in which we will all be able to finally understand one another and all the breakdown of communication in our world will come to an end and everyone will be healed and there will be unity that will last forever because of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, this morning we are so grateful for the work that you have done in bringing about the fulfillment of all of your promises. And and we see these, if we would just read our Bible carefully, we would see so much more clearly. And I think part of the problem is we've, we've spent more time just not reading the Bible, but but listening to the accounts of people's experiences and never questioning whether these experiences sound like what the Bible is telling us. And so, Lord, what we need to do is we need to be faithful people who read the Bible, understand the Bible, and therefore we thank you for your word.
which is faithful and true. It never points us in the wrong direction. And it reminds us that history also is not pointed in the wrong direction. It's going in the right direction. And even though uh, p- there will always be madmen who will rule the world, uh, the, the madmen of the world will always ultimately find themselves before the throne of Jesus, kneeling, confessing him to be Lord. And because we will all understand clearly on that day, we'll get to hear every tyrant say before us, to Jesus, you are Lord. And our faithfulness will be vindicated in that moment. Until then, receive all of our praise, Jesus, for you are worthy. Amen.